There you are. So welcome everyone. I'm Birch and tonight is part two of our uh, rune overview classes, um, a survey of rune magic. Um, so tonight we're going to be uh, discussing some of the basics behind rune magic, um, talking about uh, the different ways that one might work with rune magic from divinations to spells, chants, and also blessing objects using the roots. Um, and next year we will be having a further series of classes dedicated to the runes. Um, two of those will be creating and blessing a personal rune set. Um, then we'll also learn about divination, which we're going to touch on tonight, like I said. We'll have classes on rune correspondences, understanding the different ways that the runes work together and can be used in conjunction with each other. Um, the class I mentioned uh, earlier before on uh, chanting and dancing the runes. And we'll also um, briefly touch upon Galder and uh, Stoder, or rune yoga, um, as part of tonight's class. But essentially, tonight's class is designed to be an overview, um, discussing different aspects of rune magic, how they work, um, offering some tips for further investigation um, in preparation for next year, when we will dive more into a lot of these topics. So if it feels kind of like I'm just barely scratching the surface on some of these ideas tonight, that's because I really am. Um, a lot of what I'm discussing is going to get a class or more. And also you can find a lot of books, websites, mm -hmm. and other um, present and, you know, videos as well, discussing these topics if they interest you. Um, so again, for tonight, we're going to gain a general sense of the different types of rune magic. We're going to learn how they can be used to further learning and activity on our magical paths, regardless, again, of whether you consider yourself a Norse or Germanic pagan, Wiccan, Strega, or anything else, ways in which you can incorporate rune magic into what you do. And then um, this will also get us ready for Luke Nasa, when we are going to have a gloat to slight near, complete with a blessing of a bottle of mead that we will do together prior to the hobby horse racing. So part one, what is rune magic? What, what kind of magic am I referring to here? Um, it comes from the Germanic and the Norse or Northern European traditions. Um, if you think of all magic being the use of will or tools or intention to enact some deliberate change, again, focus on what on a particular change you want to achieve, rune magic uses the runes in or as its tool to achieve that end. It can be done with an actual um, rune stone or wood block like you, the ones you would see pictured here. It can be used by writing the runes onto something. It can also be done through body movement, uh, the rune yoga that I'll be discussing later. It can be done with galder magic, which is a form of chanting to channel the energy of the rune. It can be done by a combination of all of these things. Um, but at the end of the day, rune magic is using those runes to enact a change, a directed change with magic. Um, in the hands of a rune master, uh, depending on your source or the tradition, you might hear seer, vulva, vikti, um, a rune can become a wand, a chalice, an athame a candle. It can be whatever that person needs it to be in order 
to do spell work, use divination to perceive the future events, and also a way of channeling magic into a ritual or a working. Um, a, a lot of times we're going to be talking about rune magic used to bless a particular object, the way that we're going to be doing with the mead bottle at Luke Nasa. Um, we want to enact that change. Um, it can be a form of divination. This um, is from... This comes again from what we discussed in the first class um, a couple of weeks ago, where the origin of the runes stems from the Well of Erd, which is overseen by the fates. And so in a sense, since these runes are from that very firmament of our existence, they can be used to see the future. And in a variety of other ways. Um, and so it is a very complex, multi-layered magical system, which you can spend decades learning and still find new discoveries. As much as I've worked with the runes over the years, as much as I appreciate them, I'm always learning new things from them. It's when you have a, a set of runes or you work with the runes, you can kind of feel where that that relationship is partnership where there is room to grow and learn from each other and to learn more and more about them all the time even just doing this class i never really done much on rune yoga before now i think it's really super cool hence next year's class so to start with where is some of the sources of rune magic? Well, one of the most traditional sources of rune magic comes from the Havamal. The Havamal is a series of poems said to be spoken by Odin, referred to in the Havamal as the High One, to humankind, offering a series of proverbs, wisdom, general advice, and towards the end, the story of how he went in quest of the runes, ending in his hanging from Yggdrasil, the world tree, for nine days and nine nights until the runes revealed themselves to him. These two sections of the Havamal are known as Odin's rune song, which details his time on Yggdrasil, and magic charms, which follows immediately after and explains what the runes can be used for magically. These correspond approximately to the 16 runes of the younger Futhark, which I have pictured here, um, although there are 18 runes in those Ets. So there are two that do not quite have a rune. It could, reasons for this differ, um, possibly it's a rune from a different alphabet, magical symbols that were never incorporated into an alphabet. Um, in Guido von Liszt's Armanen rune section, which he came up with in his book, uh, The Mystery of the Runes, which I discussed last time, he um, creates a rune set that is designed to match up with these 18 spells. Um, for the two missing ones, he uses an E from the Anglo-Saxons runes and a Ge based on Gebo um, for the last one. But again, like I said, others have argued that there really are no two missing runes, that these two are not meant to ever be symbolized in anything in particular. Um, so I'll just read a, a few examples here um, from the uh, the magic charm section of the Havamal. The first charm I know is unknown to rulers or help of any humankind. Help it is named for help it can give in hours of sorrow and anguish. I know a second that the sons of men must learn if they wish to be leeches or doctors. 
I know a third in the thick of battle. If my need be great enough, it will blunt the edges of enemy swords. Their weapons will make no wounds. I know a fourth. It will free me quickly if foes should bind me fast. With strong chains, a chant that makes fetters spring from the feet, bonds burst from the hands. I know a fifth. No flying arrow aimed to bring harm to men flies too fast for my fingers to catch it and hold it in midair. I know a six. It will save me if a man cuts runes on a sapling's roots. With intent to harm, it turns a spell. The hater is harmed, not me. If I see the hall ablaze around my benchmates, though hot to the flames, they shall feel nothing if I choose to chant the spell. I know an eighth that all are glad of, most useful to men. If hate fester in the heart of a warrior, it will soon calm and cure him. I know a ninth. When need I have to shelter my storm, my ship on the flood, the wind it calms, the wave it smooths, and puts the sea to sh sleep. I know a tenth. If troublesome ghosts ride the rafters aloft, I can work it so they wander astray, unable to find their forms, unable to find their homes. I know an eleventh. When I lead to battle old comrades in arms, I have only to chant it behind my shield, and unwounded they go to war. Unwounded they come from war, unscathed wherever they are. I know a twelfth. If a tree bear a man hanged in a halter, I can carve and stain strong runes that will cause the corpse to speak, reply to whatever I ask. I know a thirteenth. If I throw a cup of water over a warrior, he shall not fall in the fiercest battle, nor sink beneath the sword. I know a fourteenth that few know. If I tell a troop of warriors about the high ones, elves and gods, I can name them one by one. I know a fifteenth that first Thorodagir sang before Delling's doors, giving power to gods, prowess to elves, foresight to Raptir Odin. I know a sixteenth. If I see a girl with whom it would please me to play, I can turn her thoughts can touch the heart of any white-armed woman. I know a seventeen. If I sing it, the young girl will be slow to forsake me. I know an eighteen that I never tell. To maiden or wife of man, a secret I hide from all, except the love who lies in my arms, or else my own sister. So those are the 18 spells, and you see the last two are the ones that do not have a direct correspondence here. So on the next oldest known um, sources of the rune magic comes from divination. Games of chance and luck were great favorites among the people of the Germanic tribes that Tacitus saw when he was exploring that region um, in, from the Roman Empire. The, he also was the first to record the use of runes or something rune-like for divination. German priests would cast lots to divine the will of their gods, which were cut from the limbs of fruit-bearing trees. He doesn't specify what exactly was on these slots, but it's believed that this was some version or some form very similar to the Elder Futhark. Um, in the divination system he describes, you call upon the gods to guide an answer to a question. Then you take three runes, lay them out, and interpret the answer. I actually use a very similar method um, 
when I use divination, I always pull it in groups of three. Um, and I pull it on groups of three. Uh, first one to Erd, who controls all that was, Verhandi, who controls what is, and Skuld, who controls what is still yet to become. Um, it's a deceptively simple way of doing divination, but because each rune has many layers of meaning behind it, and the way the runes interact with each other can influence what meaning it has, you can get a lot of depth, even with a, this, a very simple seeming pull um, based loosely again on past, present, and future. Um, if you, um, and that's, I use a, a pull for that, but other people also um, like to use a rune toss. Um, and here the meanings can get even more intricate. Um, some, in some systems, the meanings can even change depending on whether the rune lands upright, sideways, or upside down. And if a rune lands upside down, for example, it might mean that the rune is trying to pull itself out of the reading. Um, but also, so you can probably even see in this picture, like Gebo, for example, no matter how you toss Gebo um, with that X shape, you're never going to see it's never it's perfectly symmetrical on all sides. You can't say, oh, Gebo is sideways or Gebo is upside down. And because of that, these runes in a toss are extra powerful. They have an additional strength to them um, simply because of that. Um, and whether you're doing a pull, a toss, or even some of the rune spreads that uh, you might see out there, um, in my experience, it's usually best to do things in multiples of three. Um, a toss, a lot of times I'll see nine being used for the toss to get a higher number where you can still get a pretty good picture of multiple runes, but it's still within that multiples of three and nine is an extremely sacred number in um, German and Norse traditional magic because again, you're tying the nine days that Odin hung from the tree, the nine worlds, and other um, examples of that, um, which um, can be very, very powerful and useful. Um, and I'll go into some of the finer points of divination more next year. Um, we're gonna have an entire class on rune divination, um, but um, for right now, I just wanna talk very briefly about it um, fate, as um, the Germanic and Norse people understand it, and as the runes work with, calls upon the runes link to the very roots of the world tree, the Adrasal. So if you imagine what that means, the very root of the world, not just this world, but all the worlds, you're talking about a very deep level of a universal subconscious a place where everything is drawn up from. Um, there's a well there that the Norns oversee, and that well is what feeds and cares for and protects the, the tree itself from any all the damage that is wrought on it by some of the animals that work on it. And when it comes to fate, it's like a tapestry. It's not predestination in the sense that I am destined to do X, Y, and Z, and I cannot change it. I cannot alter my fate. The runes don't show you a fate that is completely inalterable. What it does, it's like the warp and weft of that loom. You are the weft, the horizontal moving through your destiny, and your destiny is comprised of the vertical strands of that loom. It's the influences of the fate, what you are going to encounter, and the overall fate itself is what happens when those two threads make an overall picture. And the runes show you 
what what a little bit of what that overall picture is going to be. A lot of that is Skull's influence is like, okay, what is the overall picture here? What what's the final tapestry going to look like? Where, you know, um, Verhandi will show you, okay, where where's your thread right now? What what's it going through? And Ord is the part that's already been woven. And if you think about how all those three things interact, it will tell you a lot about what's going on. But because you're still going through, you can alter the colors of your thread. You can alter how you approach it based upon knowing what is there ahead of you. Um, so that's a little bit on divination and the fates. We're going to go into a lot more about how this works and how to read and how to know what you're seeing, as well as a different rune spreads um, next year. Um, so if that interests you, um, in her book, Leaves of Yggdrasil, Freya Asmund lays out several detailed rune spreads that she uses um, that we're going to probably talk about some of those. But if you're interested, you can definitely read up on them between now and next year. Will you post a list of those books on, on our page on Facebook? Yes. And actually I took a picture of them, but I will refresh that image most certainly. All right, so runes and healing magic. Um, Kenaz and Urus are the two that I'm gonna be talking about here today. They are two of the most commonly use runes when it comes to healing magic with the runes. Um, Kenaz is, among its other uses, it's a rune of illumination. Its three meanings can be summed up as torch, uh, controlled fire that serves human needs in a dark space, ulcer, a wound, especially one that has been dealt in battle, and keen, so overtones of boldness, intensity, interest. It is actually directly related to our English word keen, like he's really keen on this, you know, the dog is really keen on that scent out in the backyard, right, Sally? <laughs> um, its specialty is transformation and insight. So you might use Kenaz as one of your runes in healing magic if you have a, in, an injury, if you've been hurt, if you have an ulcer, or also if you're dealing with an unknown ailment. In that case, you would not be working so much on the ulcer side of it, you'd be working on the illumination. You know, a torch for the doctor to use to shine into that dark space of the unknown and reveal what is going wrong with you. Um, versus if it's an injury, you know, the ulcer, the wound, transform it and help it to heal. Um, but an Uruz is a very traditional rune of healing. Um, with its shape, it draws life force energy from those roots of Yggdrasil upwards and then washes it back down to the roots, taking the weariness and harm back with it, while with the upward stroke, it brings that refreshing waters from the very roots of the of the world. And it's interesting because that's actually very similar to what we do in our opening healing spell. If you think about it, put your roots deep down into the mother and pull up her healing energy. And then you raise your arms above your head and send it out to where it's needed. Mm -hmm. It's very, very similar. I'm going to have to ask Alba if we can uh, put a little urus on the table for when we're doing that to kind of back us up. Um, so Urus, therefore, helps not just with physical wounds and ailments. It can replenish the mind, the body, and the spirit. From its primary meaning, the Oryx, it brings a bull's strength with it. Um, and all the vi vitality of that bovine symbolism. It also represents Althumbla, the mythical cosmic cow who nursed Ymir, the 
cosmic giant and the foundation of our universe before creation began. White mud, Hevita Or, is used by the Norns to nourish Yidrasil from its roots. And that also say, shares its name with the Ur of Urus. And so just like how that white mud from deep below the roots can be used to heal the tree, through this rune, it can be used to replenish your body and your spirit if you're suffering from a kind of mental malaise. It is also the power of rain. And anyone who has ever watched the grass and plants and flowers sprout up after refreshing rainfall knows the healing virtue of a good soaking drizzle, which is the kind of rain that Urus provides. It represents the downflow rather than the upflow from Idrisil, but it is still an essential part of the life force contained within this rune. But of course, as with any healing magic, consent matters. If you know how, you can use these runes on yourself if you wish, but do not use them on anybody else without your, their permission. So if you want to use someone, you can speak to them about it, but don't do anything without the other person's explicit permission. All right. Elemental rune magic. Elements are just one of the many ways that runes can be combined with or correspond to other magical workings and other roots. It's, and of course, this is also an aspect of magic that pretty much every witch and other pagan uses in some form or another. I remember when um, Amethyst was doing her talk on, you know, green witchcraft, she was talking about rune magic. Or last week when we were talking about the sea glass and how you could put runes onto sea glass. Um, so there's a lot of ways that the runes can be used to work with the elements um, as well. And so as you go through the levels of meaning on the runes, some of the uh, elements are pretty clear, pretty obvious, while others are a little bit more esoteric. Um, but even with a brief summary, you can often find runes that will correspond with your needs as you're doing this. So for example, with earth, you might be talking about Jera. This is a rune of the harvest, the year, the cycle of life. So when you're working with earth energies, you'd be working with the cycle of the seasons, the wheel of the year. Um, Burkana, it symbolizes the birch tree. This is the mother earth, the mother goddess. Um, it is the feminine version of that nurturing power of the earth. Um, you would also have Ingwas, which represents the god Ing, also known in some traditions associated with Freyr. He is the Earth Father. We don't talk a lot about Earth Father so much um, compared to Earth Mother that I've noticed, but historically the Earth Father, especially in the German tradition, is just as important as her, um, as her consort. And this is the nurturing power of the Earth with the masculine element. Um, he represents you know, the seed. Um, and I often connect and feel his energies as being very similar to the Green Man. Um, you know, like we have our Green Man Alliance here at the Grove that would be kind of working with him. Um, the, the, green, uh, the Green Nurturer, the green, the green Man, the Green Masculine. With water, um, you might have Urus. I've already kind of discussed that where it's, it's the drizzle, the rain. Um, you also have Lagus. Lagus is um, symbolic of water in general. It refers to lakes, seas, and the water elemental, um, the elemental power of water. You also, since we are talking about a Northern European tradition, you have frozen water. Isa, ice. This is a rune of binding, of freezing because it represents the um, 
icy bridges that connect um, in Niflheim and connect us with the land of the dead. Um, and you have Hagalas, the cold grain, the crystal. Um, and one of its workings, you have the sense of frozen life force, crystallized, frozen, not yet come into its full movement, but it is the force behind the movement. Last time I talked about this being, you know, kind of symbolic of the moment of the Big Bang or what happened just before. Um, that's for a potential, but like any potential, it's not moving yet, so it can be said to be frozen. Um, opposite of that are the elements associated with fire. Um, kenos, like we discussed in healing. This is the controlled fire. Fire that has yielded to the power of humanity. It's a torch. It's a firelight. Um, but you also have sawilo, solar fire, primordial fire. Fire that is beyond the immediate direct control of people. If you are in Florida, California, Texas right now, and you step outside and you get the full blast of the July and August sunlight, that's so we love. <laughs> it will make even me sweat. Um, and also, I often look upon Nalthis as a fire rune. This is the need fire. The fire of inspiration, desire, necessity. It's that fire that drives you when the chips are down and things have to happen. Um, and then for air, you might talk about Ansus. Ansus is breath. It refers to the first, first breath that created life within the first humans. It's song, it's music. It connects us with Odin and also has element of spirit with it too, not just air, in that it does connect us with Odin, with the divine, and also, like I mentioned before, with the Alan of the Druids, that sense of a spiritual sound that connects and unifies all living things. Um, you might also work with Tiwaz. Tiwaz is the historic sky father god of the Norse tradition, um, just like Zeus, just like Jupiter. Um, he's the sky father, so um, you could see Tiwas there. Also, it's not totally traditional, but I often see Dagas as being air. Um, it refers to day and light, but it's light that's filtering through the day. Sunset, you know, when you see the sunset, the reason why it turns red is because the light is filtering through the atmosphere at a particular angle to turn it red versus blue. Um, so it's that medium through which sunlight travels, which is, of course, the air, the atmosphere of the Earth. All right, next slide. <laughs> So, Galder. This is a very intricate magical form. In its broadest sense, it contains the entirety of active rune magic. On a practical level, Galder is a form of chanted or spoken ritual magic steeped in poetry and rhythm, which is based on the runes and used to raise energies, speak to the gods, bless objects, harness rune magic, and focus the will of the rune worker towards their desired end. And it does all of that through the power of poetry, drumming, chanting, 
clapping, stomping your feet. Um, you can hear echoes of it in Anglo-Saxon alliterative poetry, where the sound of a sentence speaks to its secrets and from the clip-clop thunder press of horses' hooves. But all poetry can feed into this magic, as can the sounds of the runes themselves or the names of the runes. Um, if you chant the names of the runes a certain way, you can do this. But also, each rune has one or more Galder sounds or chants that are associated with it. Um, you can chant these in conjunction with the rune's name or on their own um, to channel that into a ritual, into a spell, into a working. Um, also, it can be done like we're going to do next year while doing a pose of the ro rune yoga, the stodor um, poses. So, you know, as you're as you're like standing, you know, channeling the rune with your body, you're making the sounds and you're chanting that way, and your mind is focusing on, okay, this is what I want to achieve. And those of you who have joined in on my monthly bloats are probably familiar with Galder sounds already because I find them extremely effective at channeling rune energy with a group of people, even people who may not be familiar with rune magic on their own, but combined with drumming, howling, firelight, rattling, moons. Uh, they're an extremely potent form of rune magic. And they can also be used to filter that magic in to other workings and rituals. Um, and so a lot of it really has to be heard, which is why I had that clip there um, to really get it because it's something you don't just learn about, something you really have to feel with your chest. Like, like when you get a big, when you get the drumming and all the music and all the sounds working together, you can feel that vibration. And each sound of that vibration brings a different harmonic to the magic. And so by matching the sound with the um, with the intention, you can bring them both together and really create that magic. You know, so you know, say you wanted to do a finding money spell and you want to chant it. Right. So you would say, say, thank you for money. Fat, 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 fat. And cannot for illumination to find. Cat, 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 fat, cat, fat, cat, fat, cat, fat, cat. And you will apparently scare the poor dog laying next to you into waking up and being like, what's wrong, Birch? <laughs> I'm finding money, Sally, so we could buy you more turkeys. She's like, can you find me a turkey room? But it's it's that kind of sound that you make with your voice to harness the magic. And it can, again, be integrated into other magics um, to, uh, to bring it to life, so to speak. So again, this is a topic that we are going to dive into very thoroughly next year um, when we do our Dancing and Chanting the Runes class. Okay, so the next type of rune magic is the one that I've seen called Stoder, Stadhagalder, or Rune Yoga. For obvious reasons, I usually just call it Rune Yoga <laughs> because the other words are a lot harder to say. This is a um, magical system based on the runes, which uses gesture and posture to invoke the power of the room. It originated in 20th century Germany based on Indic practices, hence the name rune yoga is frequently applied to this practice, even though it is a distinct system than the yoga used um, by most yoga practitioners today. It is based entirely upon the runes and it was invented by a couple of guys in Germany in the 20th century. It's important to remember here that the body in the German and Norse tradition is not an enemy to be fought. 
You should work with your body while doing the rune yoga, not against it. Your body is holy. It contains the divine power of your godly ancestors and all the magic of being your body. It's tied very deeply to you because at the end of the day, the body is the vessel by which the most, you know, but in which you exist. You're without your body, you're just a disembodied thought and soul drifting about. Um, it's designed to work with the Galder sounds and chants, combining breath work with body attunement and focused will, both of which will be ultimately beneficial to enhancing your magic and what you're trying to achieve. So we're going to be um, covering this topic in depth um, as the dancing with the runes part of dancing and chanting with the runes. But you can see here each, um, there's slight variations in how the stances work. Um, we'll have a handout that will have all of the different poses um, at that class. But essentially, if you look at like, you know, you're, you're, you're contort, you're bending your body or turning your arms in order to create the shape of the different runes. And so you can imagine, right? Like as you're standing here doing this, you start, you know, you hold your arms out that certain way or you bend your leg or, you know, some of them you're sitting or kneeling. And then while you're in that posture, you have the chant and you have your intention at the ready and you just make that chant while you're doing the pose. And by combining the two, you're just doubling or tripling up on the rune magic that you're working with to increase its power and its effectiveness. So, all right. Rune blessings and talismans. Tools, weapons, and other objects of daily life have runes on them, not only to identify who they belong to, but also to convey protection and other blessings to their wielder. This is an element of rune magic so popular, it has found its way into modern fantasy novels, as well as the daily practice of many heathens and Norse pagans. By taking one or more runes, and inscribing them onto an object, or doing a blessing of the object using these runes, you can transfer the magic properties of those runes onto that object. And then from the object, the idea is whoever is holding or using that object would be able to share those same blessings. Um, it can hold, it can store that energy. It um, also just looks cool, which mm -hmm. is not to be underestimated. Um, the sable blade at the bottom of this slide is one example of this. While rune swords are not as frequently found as fantasy lore would have us believe, this is one of the rare swords found that has an Othala, Hagalas, Swastika, Urus, and Thurasas on it. All of these runes would have conveyed a sense of protection, good luck, and strength to its bearer before he was laid to rest with it in his barrow. While in sagas, such as the Sigur Fundmundal, it would seem like all swords had runes on them, because that text describes in detail how to inscribe victory runes onto a sword. Um, Archaeology has only found a few dozen out of thousands of swords with runes actually inscribed onto them. Hard to say why. Maybe, you know, rune swords were just never all that particularly common. Personally, I think it's more likely that swords with runes on them were less likely to be left into a barrel. If you think about it, any sword with runes on it would probably have been considered to be extremely lucky and extremely powerful. And if you or your family are in danger and you happen to know that great grandpa's rune sword is in the barrel with him, are you going to leave the sword in the barrel or are you going to pull it out and give him a replacement to carry into the afterlife? <laughs> At the end of the day, 
most people are going to probably rob that grave <laughs> or replace it. Um, same thing with those swords might also have been more likely to simply be passed down within the family until they eventually wore out, broke down, or me were melted down and turned into something else, but then to be laid to rest. As in anything else in archaeology, absence of evidence does not automatically imply, you know, evidence of absence, simply because it's a matter of what survives to be found. Um, same thing with rune talismans. Um, very few runic talismans have survived. Most of what we have are from the later mil Middle Ages and are oftentimes as much Christian as they are pagan. Because a lot of people don't realize, um, especially in parts of Scandinavia, the Christians use the runes just as often as the pagans would have done. Mm -hmm. um, they were very, you know, it was a form of magic and just like today or any the other things that they did, a lot of the magical was syncretized, including the roots. Um, however, it's very likely from what little we do know from sources such as Tacitus, that a lot of runes were believed that they needed to be inscribed on something that was once living, like wood. And these materials would be very easy to come by. You know, it's easy as finding a good branch, cutting it, carving it. Um, but unfortunately, those same pieces of wood are not going to survive over the course of 2000 years. Um, it's unless they happen to fall into a bog and be preserved, wood is not going to last 2000 years. Um, the oldest rune objects we have found are jewelry um, made of metal. And, but again, only a few of these are actually from the Viking age. But same thing as you might find with the blades, you know, jewelry, cups, tools, they're all, they all easily can be broken down, melted, reused, and turned into something else. And when that happened, the runes would also have been lost on them, um, which is why the most common way to find a uh, rune writing from early on the archaeological record is on a rune, so rune stone. Most of what we have of written runes is on a rock because those are what survive the easiest and which will stand the test of time the best and still be legible. I mean, if you look at that sword in that picture, you can clearly see that sword did as well as it could, but it's very, very hard to read um, anything on it. The runes that are there are mostly wiped away. However, despite the lack of archeological evidence, Modern Norse pagans and heathens absolutely love their runic inscriptions. It's a very popular way to decorate swords, rings, cups, drinking horns, and just about anything else we can get our hands on. And so that is why um, when we are together at Lugnasa, we're going to be blessing a bottle of mead and we are going to be doing that at Sleipnir's Bloat. And we're gonna to work together as a group to decide what kind of blessing we want to bring to this mead and that day. And then we will do it together. And then we can drink the mead. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Aye. Um. Shine, are you still having issues? No, it's okay. Okay. I'm just quiet. <laughs> okay, cool. No, you're saying you can't hear anything. No, I couldn't hear when she was playing the video. I couldn't hear the video. Oh. Neither could I. Okay, let me go back. I think I know how to fix that. Hold on. Okay. Um, give me a sec, call. Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to have to stop the screen share. All right, stopping the screen share. Um, I'm going to share screen. Share sound. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to go back now. Okay, here we go. You guys heard it that time? Yes, no problem. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think I forgot to hit the sound button. It's okay. It's a Friday. It is a Friday. Any questions, anybody?